begin this morning with the high stakes Georgia Senate runoff election tomorrow as both incumbent Raphael Warnock and GOP rival Herschel Walker hit the campaign trail one more time to win over last minute voters. But for Walker, there is new controversy this morning that could derail his efforts to win. A former girlfriend is accusing him of domestic abuse during their five year relationship in the early 2000s. She recounted the incident on camera for the first time to NBC News. We do want to warn viewers some may find this disturbing. He just hovered over me and pinned me on the wall and um, began, you know, continued to say, you want to see a man, I'll show you a man. And he was pressing his forehead against mine. My head was against the wall. Um, he was speaking with so f such force that his saliva was all over my face. And he had his hand on my throat and my chest. And then he leaned back to throw a punch. And luckily I was able to avoid that. And uh, the punch landed on the wall instead of me. Walker's campaign has not responded to multiple requests from NBC News for a comment. It is the second accusation of abuse that Walker has faced in recent years. We have our team here to help walk us through the latest from Georgia, including NBC News correspondent Jermaine Lee in Atlanta and NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. So, Mark, let's start with you. The incumbent Senator Warnock holds a very small lead over GOP challenger Herschel Walker. That's what we saw really in November. This latest controversy with Walker comes after several other controversies during the general election. Does it look like these are having an impact in the polls? Is, is this Warnock's race to lose right now? Yeah, Joe, I think the only thing for us to glean from the polls right now, as well as the results from the general election last November, is this, ra this race remains competitive and incredibly close. And when you do look at the most recent polls that are out there, like CNN's that came out last Friday, uh, it shows Warnock with just a small lead uh, among likely voters, but within the margin of error. War Raphael Warnock also ends up having a substantial advantage over the airway. Waves. Um, and the one thing that Herschel Walker will not benefit from on Tuesday that he was able to benefit in the November general election was the Republicans who went to vote for Brian Kemp, the incumbent governor who ended up winning re-election over Democrat Stacey Abrams. This is just Warnock versus Herschel Walker, and that's a different dynamic. And also what's different is we still just don't know the, the composition of the turnout in this runoff election, which is smack dab between Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays and just comes a couple of of days after the SEC championship football game that Georgia ended up winning. So, Tremaine, let's look at the campaign trail. Both Walker and Warnock making their final pitches to voters today. Comes after a full weekend of campaign events. Let's just listen to some of what Warnock had to say to voters on Sunday. Over the last few years, especially, we've been going through a bit of a contraction, and there are folk who, who are trying to divide us but because of young people like you, I really do believe that our best days are not behind us. Our best days are in front of us. So, Tremaine, what message are we hearing from both candidates just a day before this election? And who are they targeting in these final campaign events? Joe, certainly uh, Warnock is, is appealing to his base, that he has uh, been there before, he's worked across the aisle, uh, that he is the, the values candidate given all the controversy around uh, Walker. But certainly he's also uh, been pushing ads, uh, allowing voters themselves to react to some of the, uh, the more kind of absurd things that Herschel Walker has talked about, bad air and vampires and werewolves. Um, but for the, for the uh, Walker campaign, you know, he's trying to tie Warnock uh, to crime and inflation, saying that that's part of the Joe Biden agenda. Uh, but what's really important here is their base um, to make sure that folks who who did not vote uh, maybe in the midterms are coming out um, to support their candidates, especially for, for Warnock, because Democrats have, um, you know, ha have had the lead in getting out early in terms of absentee uh, mail in and also uh, in person early voting. So, Tremaine, the early voting in Georgia, it's done. It ended with a bang on Friday. Two previous early voting state records were broken. Do we know who turned out for early voting? How the numbers break down? We do. It's pretty interesting. Of the, of the nearly 1.9 million people who voted early, again, smashing records on two consecutive days, um, 76,000 of those folks did not vote in the midterm. 76,000 people who did not vote before showed up in the runoff. Uh, broke down like this, 55% white, 32% black. 52% of those folks were Democrats and 39% Republican. Uh, but again, 
a lot will, uh, you know, uh, rest on who comes out to vote this Tuesday. Even though records have been broken, it still comes down to turnout, turnout, turnout. Joe. And Mark, I mean, Democrats have already secured a majority, rather a very slim one in the Senate. So why is this so critical for Democrats to try to win? Joe, two real reasons. Number one is actually the composition of the committees that you have in the United States Senate. Because the current Senate is 50-50 with Vice President Kamala Harris casting the tie-breaking vote, the power-sharing agreement is that the committee composition is exactly right down the middle. Uh, but if Democrats are able to have a 51-49 to 49 majority, then all of a sudden they end up getting a substantial uh, 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 majority on these committees, which can actually help in passing legislation. The other reason, Joe, is it just gives you more breathing room if you are uh, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, that you are able to say, hey, Joe Manchin doesn't support this, but some, uh, but but you have an additional Democrat who does. And so that breathing room with the a new power sharing agreement or just a new uh, committee composition uh, would be a substantial difference from the current uh, Senate power that Democrats have. Mark Murray and Tremaine Lee, thank you for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. The FBI has been called into Moore County, North Carolina, where a state of emergency was declared after two power stations were destroyed. Authorities are calling it an intentional attack. Police say at least one person fired gunshots at two energy substations on Saturday night, cutting off electricity in the area. This morning, 45,000 customers are still without power. While no motive has been revealed, investigators are looking into speculation that the substations were targeted because of a drag show taking place place nearby. We're living in some challenging times. Challenging times that I never thought in my 40 years in law enforcement we would be seeing things and dealing with folks that are dealing with things that we're dealing with. But unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to deal with this. So. A curfew is currently in place. Power officials warn it could be days before power is fully restored to the area. To Washington now, where the Supreme Court is set to hear arguments in a case that could upend certain protections for same-sex couples and those who identify as LGBTQ. It's all centered around a Colorado business owner who sued the state over its anti-discrimination law, claiming she should be able to refuse to design wedding websites for same-sex couples without punishment because she opposes it. Joining us now is NBC News Washington correspondent Amy Shalcindor and NBC News legal analyst Cynthia Oxen. Great to have you both with us. Thank you for joining us. So, Yamisha, I'm going to start with you. Now, this is the second time in just the past five years that the Supreme Court is hearing a case that focuses on a business owner not wanting to perform a service for a same-sex couple due to those religious beliefs. So walk us through this particular case that's being presented today. What are the details in this one? Well, good morning. This is a big day at the Supreme Court as justices are gearing up to hear oral arguments in a case centered, as you said, on LGBTQ rights as well as free speech. Now, the owner of a website creating company, a 303 Creatives, her name is Lori Smith. She sued the state of Colorado. She's being represented by Alliance Defending Freedom. That's important because that conservative Christian law group has brought a number of cases before the Supreme Court. Lori Smith is, is arguing that she should be allowed to create websites, wedding websites for, for for opposite sex couples, but not for same sex couples because her religious beliefs um, oppose same sex marriage. So she is saying essentially, I have free speech not to create things that I um, that I religiously oppose. Civil rights groups say that she's looking for a license to discriminate. They say that she, that this idea that free speech would allow her to to not um, comply with Colorado's discrimination laws, which prohibit discrimination against uh, people for because of their sexual orientation, that that would be problematic because you could also see people like hairstylists or restaurant owners say that that's also part of their free speech and part of their artistic words and artistic expressions. Um, but Lori Smith is essentially saying, I want to make sure I'm suing preemptively before I start creating websites to try to get a, a license to be able to do this. Um, it's interesting because in 2018, we saw a Colorado baker come before the Supreme Court saying mm -hmm. he didn't want to create cakes for same-sex couples. He won, but on very narrow ground. So this case is really a second bite at that apple of this question with the 6-3 majority, I mean, a 6-3 majority when you have conservatives, religious conservatives on the court, a number of court watchers say that this is the kind of case that these justices were looking for and that might be in favor of Lori Smith. Mm -hmm. Savannah? 
Cynthia, let's bring you in here, and I want to reference something Yamish was just talking about, add a little bit of context here. It comes on the heels of another landmark decision from the court that was back in 2020 that banned workplace discrimination based on sexual orientation. What sort of impact could this particular case have on things like that, on anti-discrimination laws, and, and then maybe also even free speech in general? Well, I think it's going to drive a huge hole in uh, the protections for LG. Of BTQ people. I mean, what, the the problem is that the justices aren't really going at it in a straightforward way and overturning uh, the anti discrimination laws. What they're doing is creating this big hole that for purely expressive conduct. But you can just see how you could frame purely expressive conduct as almost anything. It's I created a cake, or I created a pasta dish, or I'm doing an artistic expression of the manner in which I'm doing my paintings or the way I'm doing nails or the way I'm doing hair. So it does, you could drive a truck through the hole that could come out of this case and it's very problematic. Yamish, we know last week the Senate passed what's known as the Respect for Marriage Act. It's a bill that would give federal protection to both interracial and same-sex couples. And now that's received bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. So explain to us the importance of a bill like that headed into today's arguments and give us an update on when we can expect that vote in the House on that. Well, the bipartisan group of lawmakers who voted to pass this in the Senate say that this is really critical to protecting interracial couples as well as same-sex couples and the laws that protect their marriages. Um, Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's still House Speaker for a couple more weeks, she said that she's going to bring this to the House floor for a vote on Tuesday. It is expected that President Biden will sign it in short order. And this is really, they, they Democrats in particular, but some Republicans who also are supporting it, this is really just extending the protections for LGBTQ rights at a time where many feel as though those rights are under attack. You think of the Club Q shooting that happened with many people feeling very tense about the arguments that are being made against LGBTQ rights. There's also, of course, the politics of this, where we're see we've seen a number of Republicans across the country um, running on uh, against tr things like transgender rights, um, transgender people competing in sports. So really the politics of this are that people want to, lawmakers who are supporting this, want to make sure that there's a stamp to say that they are behind supporting the LGBTQ community. Savannah. And Cynthia, let me bring you in here one last time. So since 2018, the ruling that we just mentioned a moment ago, the Supreme Court has become more conservative and in turn more open to cases like this one. They've been bringing this conversation up again. And we know that after Roe v. Wade was overturned this summer, Justice Clarence Thomas called for same-sex marriage to be eliminated. Could the court's decision in this case sort of be an ominous first step in ways toward making that happen? In, in the overturning of Roe v. Wade, Thomas specifically talked about maybe overturning Oberfell, which is the same-sex marriage mm -hmm. case. And many people are concerned not only about same-sex same -sex marriage, but um, uh, contraception, interracial marriage, uh, and all kinds of those cases that are based on fundamental rights that the, that the Supreme Court has taken away. Uh, Oberfell is a danger. And let's just, let me just make sure people understand the Defense of um, Marriage Act, which is uh, about to be passed, isn't, mm -hmm. it's, it supports people's marriage, but only if it's legal in their state. So it's not like they're going so far that they're taking care of the Oberfell issue in Congress. And people who um, have same sex marriages will still be very threatened by this court if they overturn Oberfell. And it looks like uh, certainly Justice Thomas is going to try to do just that. Cynthia and Yamish, thank you both so much for joining us this morning. On Sunday's Meet the Press, Israeli Prime Minister designate Benjamin Netanyahu responded to former President Trump's interactions with noted anti Semites. We also heard from Congresswoman Catherine Clark, the incoming Democratic whip, who discussed the party's plans in the House after losing the majority. Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd has this recap. You're, you, you've got a unique relationship with former President Trump. Uh, he has consistently flirted with some really fringe characters that spout this anti-Semitic behavior, that preach white, white supremacy and white nationalism, things like that. And he doesn't denounce it. He is yet to denounce Kanye West at all. He's yet to denounce being with a white supremacist a few days ago. Why does he have this dif difficulty, do you think? I don't know. First, let me say that uh, President Trump did great things for Israel. He recognized... Uh, Jerusalem is our capital, long overdue since King David proclaimed it as such 3,000 years ago. He moved the American embassy there. He recognized our sovereignty in the Golan Heights. He got out of what I believe is the disastrous Iran deal. 
that would have paved Iran's path with gold, hundreds of billions of dollars of sanctions relief towards a nuclear arsenal. So he's done all these great things, and I appreciate it, and I remain appreciative. On this matter, on Kanye West and that other unacceptable guest, I, I think it's not merely unacceptable, it's just wrong. And I hope he, he sees his way to uh, uh, staying out of it and condemning it. I want to ask you about FTX, the uh, uh, sort of the, the uh, in fallen FTX CEO, Sam Bankman-Fried. He's given uh, nearly $40 million to Democratic causes over the last campaign cycle. I believe $6 million went to the House Majority PAC, uh, another million to the Senate side of things. Do um, you think the Democratic Party got itself too tied up um, with the crypto industry in general? You know, FTX is a cautionary tale for all of us who are looking at how do we regulate uh, crypto? How do we make sure that we are um, embracing what might be new technologies and, and currencies, but also making sure that consumers have accountability and transparency? And let me remind you that it is the Democrats who make sure that we are pushing laws to get dark money out of our politics so that people can see who's funding our campaigns. That is met with absolute resistance across the aisle, and that is an issue that we are going to continue to push. Our thanks to Chuck Todd for that recap. And now let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is with us. Michelle, good morning. Good morning to you both. Happy Monday. And we are tracking some rain. Some of it is heavy. Some will be heavy and some will cause some flash flooding as we go throughout this Monday, Tuesday, even Wednesday. So taking a look at radar and satellite, we're seeing plenty of cloud cover, also seeing that rain falling in portions of the south. It's the Tennessee Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley, into the deep south where we're seeing this rain falling. You can see the yellows, those brighter colors. That's telling us where that heavier rain is falling. So we do expect heavy rain into Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, even portions of Arkansas and Mississippi. It's it's all due to this warm front that's moving very slowly. It will be moving very slowly over the next few days, too. So showers expanding during the afternoon hours. It lifts to the north and east slowly still on Tuesday, bringing scattered rain across the east coast. You can see rain falling the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes, into New England and portions of the south. So it's a widespread area that will be seeing rain on Tuesday. Now, as we get towards Wednesday, we're going to see training storms. Those are storms that kind of go over the same areas over and over again. That will continue into the middle of the week and we will see the chance for more areas of localized flash flooding. That mainly will be in Tennessee, Alabama, and also Arkansas into Georgia. This is what we're looking at in terms of rainfall totals, anywhere from a quarter inch, but some spots even locally up to five inches, especially where you see the yellow, especially where you see the orange and red as well. That's where we're expecting the most rain to fall. So our flash flood risk, this is for today, the darker blue. That's where we expect the uh, expectation where we could see some flash flooding. Huntsville, Birmingham, Tupelo, just north of Tupelo, even into Atlanta, you could see the risk for flash flooding. That continues tomorrow. Notice that spot does not move very far. It's pretty much the same area. And then Wednesday, same story. We're going to see heavy rain in the same spots. Now, we have the rain. We're seeing uh, this warm front pulling in that Gulf moisture. It's also pulling in the warm. So we're looking at temperatures 10 to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. I mean, look at these numbers. It's December. It's near 80 degrees in San Angelo, 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. Houston near 80, 73 in New Orleans. Even up to St. Louis, we're up to 53, 69 degrees in Oklahoma City. It'll be warm, too, in the northeast. Temperatures into the 60s, 9 degrees above normal in uh, D.C. for this time of year. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.